Hello, I'm Rochelle Long, a division director at NIGMS, which is the National Institute of General Medical Sciences at NIH. Today, I wanna to start with a few announcements. First and foremost, we want to thank all personnel working in healthcare and public service at the time of COVID-19. Our thoughts go out to everyone who's been directly affected by this pandemic. One thing we thought we could do at NIGMS is to create a webinar series designed for students, fellows, and faculty. For each webinar, we'll have a 10 to 15 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session. We hope these webinars will offer content that's both interesting and useful at this time of distance learning. Today, as we begin, I want to let you know you can submit your questions live after the speaker has concluded. To do so, please use the chat box because everyone's microphones are and will remain muted. Select the moderator's name. Today, that's my name, Rochelle Long, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. Each of these webinars will be recorded and posted at our NIGMS homepage as soon as possible. And finally, future seminars in this series can be found by following us on Twitter using at NIGMS genes or at NIGMS training or on our NIGMS homepage. And now today I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Younger. John grew up in a small town in Missouri and his undergraduate and medical training at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He pursued his clinical training in emergency medicine in Orlando, Florida. And then he moved to a research fellowship at the University of Michigan. He stayed for the next 20 years where he built a research program, met his future spouse and started a family. In 2014, an invention stemming from John's research showed promise as a new research tool. With the encouragement of an early group of investors, John became a co-founder and chief technology officer for Acadium Life Sciences, where he worked for the next half dozen years. In 2019, he relocated with his family to Philadelphia, PA, where John is currently the vice president for science and technology at the University City Science Center, a longstanding innovation hub, startup accelerator, and investor in early technology companies. John has authored over 80 peer-reviewed publications, obtained over $4 million in federal grants, and raised over $6 million in venture investment. He has many publications, awards, and has involved, been involved in mentoring and service activities for his entire career. In fact, he was an Eagle Scout. John is especially well positioned to speak today based upon his professional interests in shepherding early stage biotechnologies and the intersection between federal, philanthropic, and venture funding for new tools and diagnostics. For today's seminar, John's title's talk title is Entrepreneurship and Careers in the Biotechnology Industry. Now, let's welcome John Younger. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that everyone can hear me. I hope that we're going to have reasonably good success with, uh, with the broadcast today. Um, I first wanted to just say thank you um, for the invitation. This is really amazing. Um, it's, it's a real honor to have this opportunity to, to speak with you, Rochelle, and to, and to think out loud about some of these things. I don't know if there's a more challenging week in the history of the United States to try to be thinking about what to do about our careers than this week is. Um, but I think that there's uh, some useful things uh, that we can talk about. And I think maybe some um, general guidelines for how to approach um, what is uh, hopefully a unique moment um, in all of our careers. I will tell you that um, if you're having uncertainty about your career as a trainee, you are not alone and that, um, and that everyone right now is trying to like figure out exactly what is going to happen next and how best can we be positioned for it uh, professionally and, and personally. So I'd like to spend the first few minutes of this talk before we get into the questions and answers, um, just giving you a sense of how I kind of think about this question. So, um, so when I think about myself and I think about you as, um, as scientists at various stages of your career, um, I kind of think of you as this little knowledge generating engine, right? Um, and um, in your job, your energy in the day is spent trying to create uh, new knowledge, new information. And that knowledge may be highly focused on, a, on an important application. That knowledge may be really for knowledge's sake. And both of those have an important role, I think, 
demonstrably in what, you know, what the world is trying to accomplish. As this engine, you are driven by a few things. You have a few important characteristics. Um, clearly, um, and not necessarily always acknowledged, is you have a lot of creativity. Um, you are thinking of new things. You're looking at a problem and trying to solve it in a new way. And that's very valuable. Um, I think that there is a spark. There's something that has a pile of manuscripts next to your bed that you go to sleep with at night. There's something that makes you answer emails at midnight. There's some drive that all of us bring to trying to do something new. And then I think really importantly, but not necessarily um, acknowledged as it should be, is that, is that for all of us, this is really tempered and really disciplined in this idea of a scientific method, right? There are a lot of ways of looking at the world um, and, um, and some of them um, are useful in some circumstances, some in others, but as someone who's been specifically trained to understand and really follow scientific method, that makes the application of your creativity and your passion um, unique and, and I think important in, in how new knowledge is, is generated. Now, um, this is you um, as an engine of, of new thinking. Um, it doesn't really comment on what the thing is you're thinking about. Are you thinking about structural biology? Are you thinking about traffic patterns in major cities? I don't know. Um, but in some ways, it doesn't matter. In some ways, you have been trained to interpret data, to generate new data, and to draw conclusions from it. Um, historically, when we've looked at, um, like, say, trainees and trainee grants, you would look at this and you'd say, well, what's the topic you're working on? You know, is this topic really super important? You know, are the details of the science um, really key? And historically, that's been a, that's been a focus. I think increasingly, um, and this is, you know, as an example of the MIRA program within the NIH, um, increasingly we're looking at you as the engine and saying, you will figure out the right questions to work on. What we want to make sure we're doing is supporting you as a scientist and then letting you figure out where does the science need to go next, right? And, um, and because of that, you as an engine of new knowledge could find yourself in a lot of different circumstances, all of which could be, you know, both very helpful and also, you know, can make a great career for yourself. So most of you at this point are probably sitting in an academic institution, you're in a university or some other research um, organization, and your engine is turning based on revenue that's generated from basically three different areas. There's grants, which we all know about. There's organizational funding, so your school may pay you to do particular work. Um, and there's philanthropy, there may be a donor that's paying to do this work. And all of those funds come together to support what you're doing as a thinker. Surrounding all that, though, are all the things that sometimes are a boon and sometimes kind of a headache for you, which is all the other stuff inside of university. You have teaching requirements. Um, there are legal and regulatory things around the work that you do. Um, someone's got to make sure the parking lot's got lines painted on it. All those things are things that have to happen in universities. And, and sometimes I think it's easy to forget how much of a big company universities can be. Um, but they are. And if you think about what you're doing right now, and you were to change one part of this diagram, which is where the money comes from, say organizational funding, grants, and philanthropy, and change it to commercial revenue, it's still sort of the same. Um, most of those pieces are intact. And so when we think about working in academia or working in industry, I, they're a lot more similar than they are different. And I think that's really important. It's important because it will temper your expectations about working in the future in one or the other, but it also should lower the energy barrier to making a jump from one to the other. Um, these are big organizations. Many people work there. They're trying to generate new knowledge for one motivation or another, but they have a lot of similarities. So I basically put the similarities between academia and, and commercial or industrial enterprises into these sort of buckets. Like, what's the motivation? So for academia, typically the motivation is, is pretty basic to generate knowledge. We want to generate new things, things that were not known before. That could be really basic. Or it could be somewhat applied. For organizations that are spending a lot of time thinking about potentially generating IP, um, there may be a lot of applied knowledge formation going on within an academic enterprise. Within a commercial enterprise, it's pretty focused on applied knowledge. Um, this is a, a, an enterprise to try to learn something about a thing that can be commercialized, it can be sold, um, and it can be turned into a product. That's not exclusively true, and certainly once organizations get big enough, even um, even the most industrial and commercial programs can generate basic knowledge for basic knowledge sake, and that's, that's great. 
The revenue stream in academia typically consists of grants, philanthropy, commercial revenue occasionally, and then clinical and academic outcome, right? So tenure, um, excuse me, so tuition has to be paid. Um, there may be clinical dollars that roll back into the research enterprise, but these are the usual ways in which academia is funded. Um, in um, commercial enterprises, it's really revenue. So the, com the, the company can spend what the company makes. Um, and those are important differences. Now, it's true that um, academia will say that a, a major value proposition is that the, the research you do is self-directed. You get to pick the thing you work on, and you're not kind of told what to work on. That's generally true, um, but it is also the case that it's self-directed as long as you can find someone to pay for it, right? And so if you're having success writing grants, um, then the research you're doing is the research you want to do. But if you're having a hard time finding funding, you may have to redirect what you're working on. In an industrial enterprise, um, typically there's a goal of doing something that will produce a near-term clinical benefit, something that will change patients' lives, will create a drug, will create a diagnostic, and that's really the focus. And there's a lot of discipline around sticking to the focus. There's an opportunity in industrial enterprises compared to academic enterprises that you may get to share some of the profit, right? So if, if the product does well, um, there may be profit to be shared. Another thing that I think about when I think about industry versus academia, and this may seem counterintuitive, is that in industry, you have, actually have a lot of mobility. So as you sort of mature in the company that you're working for, it would not be out of the question that the company would move you into a different silo of the organization altogether in order to make you a little bit more well-rounded, to give you some exposure to other parts of the business. And that you may find yourself in several different parts of the company before all is said and done. With an academia as a faculty member or as a scientist, you're gonna pretty much be in that role. Um, you may have responsibilities added, but it's unlikely that you, would, that you would migrate from, say, a research position into a completely administrative position unrelated to research in order to sort of broaden your horizons. It happens, but not that much actually. And so, um, and so in industry, I think that there's an opportunity to be a little bit more mobile. Now, the threats to both of these positions are also real. Um, in academia, you eat what you catch. If you can generate a grant that is successfully funded, you can do that work. If you cannot, you will not be able to do that work over the long term. As I mentioned, there may be some relative immobility um, in academia. And importantly, I think um, you need to understand, and especially in this moment, that there's some impermanence as well, right? So academic units come and go over the course of time. And if you're in academia long enough, you'll see whole programs that you thought would be around forever slowly start to become less important and, and finally disappear. Um, whole institutions can do that, although that doesn't happen very often. A similar set of threats happen in industry, and that is um, um, there has to be a lot of discipline around what's worked on, and the thing that you're working on today may not be a thing that gets worked on um, in the future. And so programs can be wound down because there's not an opportunity there anymore, and they may pick up in some other way. Um, but also companies come and go as well. They may go bankrupt, they may be acquired. All those things are real, um, and they're not all that different, I think, between academia and industry. So a startup is, um, is different. So a startup is a really, a really completely distinct entity. And I, love, I like this um, definition by Steve Blank. So Steve Blank is someone from, from Silicon Valley who's done a lot of thinking about, about startups and sort of startup theory. And, and Steve described a startup as a temporary organization that's used to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And what this means is, is that if you jump into a startup compared to jumping into, say, a pharmaceutical company, you are going to be, as an engine of knowledge generation, trying to apply um, your work towards a very limited question. Is there a thing here or not? Is there an opportunity for this idea to become a company? It could be an amazing opportunity. You may find out that in the end, what you're working on is not all that important, or you may find out that it's not important at all. Um, your job inside of a startup is different than your job inside of academia or in industry, in that your job in a startup is to understand, is this a thing or not a thing? If it's not going to be a successful thing, the goal is to find that out as quickly and as inexpensively as possible so that you can drop it. Unlike other um, things that you've done before, when you work for a startup, 
part of the success is if you figure out very quickly it's done and that it needs to stop, that's a good thing. And you will actually be valued in your next undertaking for someone who can very quickly sort of cut to the chase and decide, is this a thing or not? So I put all these out here to kind of give you a, a framework for how we're going to have this conversation today and sort of think about what your job is and what the opportunities are. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about a lot of details about all these choices, but I want to just sort of say these are kind of the, the taxonomies that I use and the, and the sort of general thinking that I use um, when we start talking about, about career choices and about going forward. Now, all this stuff was great. Um, and as of eight weeks ago, um, there were a lot of great data to suggest that your decision to do a career in life sciences was a really great decision. Um, I think that actually is still very much the case, maybe even more so than it was at the beginning of the year. Employment in the life sciences, um, investment by companies in R&D, and then total investment by you know, a civilization by the government, by, um, by industry, by investors, all of those things have been on the rise for some time. They continue to be on the rise. And I think that in the current moment, there's plenty of evidence that there's a lot of opportunity for new thinking and for new creation of both basic science and applied science as well. And so even though we're in this crazy moment, um, this is a great field to be in. And the things that you know and the strategies that you've learned are really great strategies to have on hand. And so I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about what's going, going to happen going forward. That said, um, in the exact moment, not necessarily, right? So it's really hard to know right now as a scientist and as a dad um, and as just as a person, what is going to happen next? And this is sort of the moment we've all been waiting for, right? When we've read the instructions on our safety instructions in the plane a gazillion times and never really had to think about them. Well, now actually might be a time to think about it. And I've been trying to personally, I've been working on this with my team, but with my kids, what does this moment mean? And how do we sort of best prepare for it um, so that we can take the most advantage of what's happening right now? So I think um, I would point out these things. I think we should probably spend a lot of the talk today thinking specifically about these issues. For moving forward, for you as a, ju a junior investigator, as a young scientist, I think the most important thing for you to do right now is to have no assumptions about anything regarding your career. You should not assume that your job is safe. You should not assume your job is at risk. You shouldn't assume anything. What you should do is you should make sure that you're having conversations with your mentor or your department chair or whoever your boss is about what's going on and about what your specific position is within the organization. Is there a long-term or a short-term future for you? Is it solid? Is it not solid? But you need to sort of understand where are you? Um, how does the, your organization think about you? And it, it's neither right or wrong, but it's important to know because it will, it will influence a lot of decisions that you have going forward. You don't want to proceed without having asked questions about your standing and about what's going on with your organization. You, you don't want to make guesses about those things. I also think it's really important to be very flexible. Remember, at heart, you're a trained problem solver, right? So you're an engine that knows how to evaluate data and to create new knowledge. The fact that you might be doing it in structural biology right now is great, but not necessarily critical to what you bring to the table. And so I think it's very important for all of us to make sure that we understand the difference between what we know and what we know how to do. There's a lot of things that you know that with enough time, I could probably Google the answers for. But you as an investigator and sort of a tenacious learner, that's special. And you need to be prepared to take that specialness and maybe put it into a context you never really imagined before. That flexibility will treat you very well. And it's a real asset. And not everyone's as fortunate as you to have that kind of, um, of asset available. What I tell everyone before they start making career decisions is you need to make sure you have a handle on your personal financial situation. This is really important. You don't want to be making decisions based on guesses or based on not full understanding about what's going on with your life and what's likely to go on with your life in the next couple of years. I, I always encourage people to bone up on financial literacy, learn about how money works, learn about how loans work, and how um, profits work, just learn about money because it will be important in how you make your decisions. You should definitely understand 
your benefits package in your current um, employment. You should understand your own personal budget. What are you likely to spend money on? Where could you save money going forward? But spending time, like honest time, studying your numbers and what's happening in your career, that's really valuable time spent. And so I always encourage people to make sure they understand numerically where are you at um, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And the last thing that I would always encourage people to do is to make sure in the event that you are not um, working in isolation, if you have a, a life partner, if you have kids, um, that you really have talked through with them your strategy for going forward. So I'm in a two um, professional household. My wife is a research cardiologist and we have to have this talk in the event of something really um, unexpected happening, who takes time off, right? So if one of us is gonna stay home and teach the kids who does it, we haven't decided that, but what are the rules by which we would decide it? How do we decide who does what? And when it's time for someone to take their foot off the gas for their career, who does it? How do they do it? What are the rules that we have sort of in the family? As they like to say in Michigan, ultimately it's all about the team, the team, the team. And we're very thoughtful about trying to make sure that we are um, all on the same page in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. So these things, assuming nothing, making sure you're being flexible about how you define yourself, um, making sure you understand your finances to the best that you can, and making sure that you're communicating with everyone in your life about what the rules are for how you're going to make decisions about the next step in your career. Those are all things that are, are good kind of on a normal day, but I think are really especially important right now. So with that said, um, I'd like to just open this up. And Rochelle, I know you have some questions. I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining today. And please fire away. Let's talk about some good stuff. Um, I encourage you to ask whatever you want to talk about. Thanks, John. That was great. So now I'd like to remind everyone, um, the way to ask questions is put them in the chat box. Use the drop down menu to pick my name, Rochelle Long, and I'll be watching for them. There were a few questions that I got in advance that people wanted to know about you, John. Um, for one thing, uh, people wondered when they learned your background in training, how uh, being an emergency department physician might have prepared you for an entrepreneurial career. So it's, it's a good question. So um, one of the things uh, that, I, that I really sort of appreciate over time, and, and probably everyone here has had this experience in a similar vein, is that I surrounded, I'm surrounded. i always surrounded by people who think very differently than I do. Um, and certainly there are tribes within science and there's tribes within clinical medicine. And, and sometimes it can be hard to figure out how all these things sort of self-sorted into these groups. But I think a lot of it has to do with, um, with sort of your intellectual style, right? And, um, and people that do emergency medicine are, are sometimes, they're sometimes portrayed as adrenaline junkies, right? Why, I think I'm actually not an adrenaline junkie. You know, I think if you look at the practice patterns of people that do emergency medicine, they actually do everything possible to make surprises go away. <laughs> they actually, they're not actually that into the, into the surprise. And if there's a way to sort of minimize risk, that's great. But what, um, but what we do as a group um, have in common is that um, is that we um, are comfortable making decisions pretty quickly, right? So, um, so in emergency medicine, you don't get to mull stuff over for a few weeks. You you know you get it about ten minutes. Um, you'll know what you're going to know and you're not going to know, and you're going to decide. Um, and that decision is based on some data. Some of it's not very good. That decision has to be both informed by and then ultimately bought into by people that you just met, right? And so you meet a stranger and you have a conversation and then suddenly you're making plans um, that impact their entire life, um, like literally their life. And, and there are people that like to do that and there's people that don't. Um, that sounds great when that's the tool that you need. Um, but, but not everybody, not every circumstance calls for someone that will decide something in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so uh, there's a time and a place for deciding quickly and executing on that plan. And there's other times when I'm not the right guy for the job. And, and I think for starting a company where there's so much uncertainty and there's such a time pressure to make a decision that being able to make um, the sort of the best decision you can with really poor data um, in a very tight timeline, that's a, that's a great thing for how I think. Um, I will tell you that within my own company, there was a moment when we started to outgrow that. And 
where what the company needed most was not someone who could make a split decision, but someone who would not make a split decision, right? That's not, that was not the thing that needed to happen next. And so I think that sort of cognitive style um, issue comes up, I think, in a lot of fields, right? That's how, that's how, um, that's how organizations are robust. They have lots of different thinkers and lots of different strategies and figuring out where you fit into that realm and where that, that type of thinking style is most useful will, will be very helpful to you. Now, it, it took me like 50 years to figure that out. So hopefully people will figure it out faster than that. But that's it, kind of how I think about it. You also said making decisions on incomplete data. So, so this, is, this is a style or a thought process and I have a whole slew of questions here to ask you because a lot of people are interested in what you talked about. So let me try some of them. Okay. Here we go. Um, do you have any insight into the scientific work environment difference in a CRO, CDMO setting as a scientist versus a private company in industry? Um, you know, I, not firsthand, but, you know, but my, my sense is, is that, um, you know, with, um, with with CROs um, and and you know similar manufacturing organizations things like that, but things where you are being contracted to get to a specific answer that that's a very focused thing, right? And there's some good things about that, right? So there's an exact question in front of you. There's an end to that question, right? So you ask the question, you'll get the answer. Full stop. Next project. So those things I think are good. Um, and um, and so if you're if you like. Um, being able to, you know, quantize the work that you do. I think those are really great opportunities and there's plenty of it. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last, you know, probably 10 or 15 years, and I was, I was um, part, of a, part, part of a discussion last week to talk about this, this sense that, you know, you know, 15 years ago, Big Pharma, you know, was all of these things at once. And now Big Pharma has figured out that early research, someone else should be doing that. Early commercialization, someone should be doing that. The clinical trials, someone should be doing that. And, and big pharmaceutical companies have figured out that there is a lot of value in sort of trimming down the big shop and outsourcing sort of these key things. And so, um, and so, there are questions ahead. about that coming up too. I see so many. I'm going to push you a little bit just so you get as many of them. Um, talking about fragmenting or separating elements of the industry. One question was, what is the best strategy for a biomedical research scientist to move in? How is it different from startups versus large biotech versus medium pharma? Um, I think it probably depends on how you want to spend your day. Um, and, you know, are you looking for, are you looking for a lifelong job? Are you looking for a five-year job? Are you looking for a one-year job? Those are all those are all things that you should understand about yourself. So I think part of it is, is probably the duration of the job. Uh, part of it is is likely going to be: Do you want to manage um, kind of the outsourcing of work to other organizations, right? So, would you be more comfortable as a scientist who's managing the work by other companies that are doing the science for you, and then you sort of synthesize all those results and move them forward in your company? Do you want to have a pipetter in your hand, right? Those are all things, and those are all um, those are all different approaches to being a scientist, right? But as as companies delegate more. Um, more of the kind of fundamental work outside of the sort of normal wall. Um, where, where do you want to be? Do you want to be, you know, accumulating that information and then acting on it? Do you want to be generating that information? Those are things you have to be comfortable with. And, and I will say that there's no, you don't have to get the answer right. Um, try one and see what happens um, and then try again. And so you, there's no, um, there's no, you know, loss for deciding, you know, I, this was what I thought I was going to do next, but it turns out it's not a great fit. I'm going to move on. That's all fine, right? You can always run the experiment and see what you think. So, so it's funny that you're describing fit because we have a question in the chat box. How might we view the importance of cultural fit as we look at employers in this time of uncertainty? Is it still worth taking a position with less responsibility if it lets us start somewhere in a company we're very interested in and compare it to a senior position elsewhere where we might not have been our first choice? <laughs> How do you find your fit? So I think you, it, it, it may be partly by trial and error. Um, it may be, uh, you may just hit it right, but I don't think it's ever inappropriate, um, you know, before you sign to really, to really sort of set aside all of the, you know, all the Excel spreadsheet that you have with all the pros and cons of the different jobs and to say, does this feel right or not? 
Um, that matters a lot. You got to get out of bed in the morning. You got to go to bed happy. Um, and, and thinking about culture is really important. And I think that um, anyone that's been doing this for a while understands that culture is certainly not the domain of academia or industry or startups. You can find great cultures in all of those spots and you can find not great cultures. And I think that there, I think that there's probably not as sort of like evil cultures as people think, but when a culture doesn't fit with how you view the world and what you prioritize, it seems like a bad culture. What it is, is it's a bad fit. There, there are um, places for you, no matter what your style, right? And it's really just a matter of finding that. But I can't tell you how important it is. You know, life is short and, and you will succeed in a place where you feel lined up, where you feel like you're making a contribution, and, and where you feel like people kind of think the way you think um, about lots of things in the world. And so don't underestimate how important that is, right? So I'd, I'd hate for someone to make a decision about, about a job based more on you know, what the retirement package looks like compared to whether or not they feel at home when they walk in the door. So, so speaking of uh, retirement and finances, we did get a couple of questions that relate to money, money personally, some of the points you raised in your last slide. So one of them is, thanks for mentioning personal finance. Do you have any recommendations for sound resources on that topic? And also, how do you learn about money from a business sense, especially for somebody who doesn't have a business degree? Well, we can do the second one first. So when I started doing this, I didn't know anything, right? I didn't know. I didn't know anything about this. So but there's, um, there's a, a great website that's called investopedia.com. So investopedia is like the investment Wikipedia and they have a word of the day. Um, I would suggest if you can enroll in the word of the day and do that for about six months, you'll know most of what you need to know. <laughs> I don't want to say anything about MBA programs, but you learn a lot just from getting one vocabulary word a day. But those sort of like passive little bits at a time are good. If you really want to know about finance, like, you know, offline, get hold of me. I can recommend some, you know, chunkier tomes about, you know, about how to think about entrepreneurial finance and things like that. But, but those things are fine. I don't think it's probably ever wrong. Um, to, to potentially spend a little money on a financial advisor, just a one-time look. Here's what, here's what they think. Here's how they would proceed. That might be a little bit better than just sort of like getting online and answering a bunch of questions on some website and you don't know kind of what those data are going to do. But, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one chat with someone to say, here's where I'm at. What do you, what do you recommend? I think, I think that actually could be money very well spent, right? Um, because those, pers those people will hang with you because they'll understand that you're at the front end of your career and that you could be a customer for life. And so um, um, I certainly, you know, have been working with someone for a very long time. And I, you know, I just email them once in a while and say, help me, help me think about this. And, and they've always been very supportive. Okay. So speaking of thinking about things, I have a question in a different vein here. There are a lot of research publications from academia that are not replicable due to ethical issues. Do you think research done in industry is more ethical since the whole downstream pipeline depends upon it? So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so I don't, so I don't know if I completely understand the question about things not being replicable because of ethical, uh, ethical reasons to reproduce the experiment. I, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, if, if things are unclear, they're unclear. And I think you can ethically justify, you know, the, the, the effort to clarify them. I do, th I am thoughtful, but I haven't really concluded what to make about, about reproducibility issues and whether or not they're different inside academia and, and, in industry, you would at first pass think that industry has a lot more on the line if they get it wrong, right? Um, industry can find itself, you know, a company can find itself way downstream with very expensive programs um, and, and being surprised late in the game by early data is, is, um, is extremely problematic for them, more so maybe than, you know, than for an academic. That said, um, academics, you know, there's, there's a lot to making sure that you manage your reputation. And it's a very hard problem. I will say that the, that the financial consequences to the organization are probably much more substantial um, for, for irreproducible data in industry. But, but the, you know, the reputational and, and just sort of, um, you know, other implications to academia are also really substantial. So I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a right answer to that. Um, and if I was smart, I'd probably not pick one anyway. Okay. Um, here's a question in a slightly different um, career or, or life development sort of vein. The question is, how much risk do you recommend trainees to take? For example, when you start a company, the future is unclear. 
how did you reach the conclusion that jumping to a startup position is better than staying the course? What if this move throws a person into a financial nightmare? <laughs> so, um, so a few things. So, so when I made the jump, so I, I had, I had two active R01s. Um, I was associate chair um, in my department when I, when I quit, I, I, I resigned basically. Right. And, um, and so that was, that was hard. It took me about a year to work through that decision. It wasn't like overnight. I just decided that was not actually one of my 10 minute decisions. That was a year decision. And the way that I made that decision was based in two parts. So the first part was we did a lot of work talking to potential customers so folks that would use our technology if we could get it to work. And there was so much enthusiasm by end users that said, yeah, we would, we would use this. Here's how much we would pay for it. A lot of people said, you know, yes, please. We would like to see that. And that was very influential in helping me sort of do the first pass at de-risking, right? So, I mean, arguably, you know, the investors took a risk, but the founders take a much bigger risk when they join a company and the early employees take a much bigger risk, right? So the, the investors will walk away, but, but the team can't, right? And so, so I, I de-risked it two ways. One was by hearing how much customers wanted it. Well, maybe three ways. The second was, um, was that investors were ready to come in. So we had early investors that said, John, if this is such a great idea, We'll fund it, but we're not going to fund it unless you convince us it's a good idea by quitting your day job and coming in. And so we closed our first round of finance predicated on me resigning my position. And so, so the investors were in, um, and so, and I assumed, and I assume correctly, that they knew what they were doing. So if they're going to write a check, they kind of knew that this was a thing as well. And so I used that. And then the last thing was, is, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to my wife about this and saying, what, what should I do? Um, and what is the actual downside risk? Now, it's really important, um, you know, as a 45-year-old tenured faculty to make, who's, who's, um, you know, whose spouse is also a tenured faculty, for me to decide that this was worth the risk is very different than the decision right out of grad school that you're going to take the risk. But, um, um, but, it, but there's, the way that you should think about it is, um, does this fulfill a, a, a longer term sort of experiential need that I have, right? You're unlikely to get rich. You're most likely not going to make any money off of your first startup. Most likely, I mean, clearly in excess of 80%, it will fail. Does it fulfill an experiential need that I have as part of my longer term plan? Um, and am I well suited to the work? Um, there's not a lot of downside. If you take a job in a startup for a couple of years and it fails, you haven't, you haven't lost anything, right? Um, and so, um, so the risk is, is sort of modest. You know, I, the, the real risk is, if, is, is sort of taking a job in a startup and not necessarily getting a paycheck, right? So I, I don't really advise anyone launch a startup and then just work for options or just work for free until something magical happens. I, I don't know that that's very wise. Um, but in general, I think the risk can be mitigated. And if it feels right, I think you should try it. So describe to us in your career progression, you took a couple of forays out of your um, conventional educational path. For example, sabbatical you have taken was a little different than some others might have done it. How did you sort of jump in or taste the waters in different fields that helped guide your future decision making? So I have always, I, I've tried um, when looking at new opportunities to look at the opportunity and say, is this a thing that, that needs to be done? Um, and if so, um, am I passionate about this thing? Then saying, well, what do I know about this thing? And do I have the training for it? And if I don't, what do I not have that I would need? And that's, that's kind of a different um, that's kind of a different approach than sort of evaluating all your opportunities based on your current skill set, right? So this is a thing that I do. These are the jobs that are available to me. Um, I, I don't treat it that way. I say these are the things I believe are passionate and great opportunities. How do I sort of springboard from what I know now into this next thing? And um, I think both of those are actually very acceptable paths. One of them feels a little bit riskier sort of on the front end, but on the back end, you get to explore a lot of other ideas. And I don't, I don't think there's ever been a career decision that I made that I regretted. Um, so certainly some of them were not in the direction that anyone planned. And certainly when I, when I resigned from the University of Michigan, uh, people didn't understand that at all. Um, but just sort of in the fullness of time, people look at this and go, well, of course that, that made good sense, right? It, it was the right thing to do. So I, I think that there's ways. Okay. 
You know, there's a lot of curiosity about startup, what makes it different from academia. Here's a couple of questions. If I were hired as a scientist or researcher within the company, would I still be expected to contribute to the budgetary and financial issues? Would there be an expectancy for me to know how the financial wing works within a company? And there's another question here. How are the ways that you do get funding for a startup? So I, you know, so you know, using um, using Acadium as an example, and we had we had people at Acadium that were very um, closely tied to all the operational components, right? Because there there are a lot of operational components. Um, you have to. You know, you got to have, you know, a place where you're going to order your, you know, your paper towels from. You got to have some, you got to have a way of like, you know, filing receipts. There's a, there's so many operational things. And, and within the first couple of employees of a startup, everyone's going to do everything. And you're going to be intimately familiar with all of it because you have no choice. There's no one else to do it, right? Um, as the company grows to even probably five or six employees, there starts to be the ability to specialize in such a way that you can sort of work on the thing that you really came there to work on. Um, and so, so um, there's an expectation that, um, that you sort of work within the confines of what's possible, but, the, um, but, but only at the very, very beginning are you going to be there um, with an expectation, you know, can you set up QuickBooks so we have accounts receivable? <laughs> <laughs> right? That doesn't happen except at the very beginning. Um, the way that you fund it is um, through a few ways. And, and so, um, so a startup can be funded because you paid money out of your pocket. Um, I don't personally believe that first time founders should be paying money out of their pocket because they're not smart enough to know whether or not it's a good investment. Um, if an investor wants to pay money for it, yes, you'll give up some of the company, but you're taking someone with a lot of experience in the field and they're saying, this is worth doing. And if they're a good investor, they will help you. So I think, you know, drawing early investment, I think is very important. I actually think maybe more important in most circumstances than SBIRs and STTRs. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not that is the right mechanism or not. But there is, there is a certain rubber to the road feel about going in front of an investor um, that um, while you have to sacrifice part ownership of the company, um, kind of gets you into a very different mindset than you would get into um, um, from a grant perspective. Uh, that said, there are plenty of reasons why you would write a grant um, as an early stage company, but I, I think there's nothing that compares to getting someone who does this for a living to give you their money. Um, because if they've done that, then you've clearly demonstrated a bunch of things that suggest that this is good going forward. So thanks. I want to ask a couple of questions about scientific relationships, in particular collaborations. I was asked what types of collaborations are useful to entrepreneurs and how do collaborations with entrepreneurial relationships differ from those in strictly an academic environment? You know, it's really interesting because I think that one of the things in my experience um, from the startup perspective is that um, it became actually very difficult to have traditional uh, scientific collaborations. Um, and um, and for, for a couple of reasons, I think, you know, as someone that sort of left academia, uh, there was a sort of question of, well, what, what's going on with you that you would leave? Um, and so it certainly, you certainly put yourself in a different spot. But the other thing is, is that, that there's a lot of concern over intellectual property. And I think far more than there needs to be. Um, founders are concerned that universities are going to scoop um, their intellectual property and that they'll, they'll make a lot of entanglements. Universities are concerned that their faculty may give away an important idea um, and that an opportunity you know, to generate um, some royalty revenue would be left on the table. Um, and, and you find yourself in these, in these discussions that generate a lot of paperwork and, and certainly generate some legal fees, but not necessarily really a lot of value. And so I, I was quite surprised um, at I had, to, had to recalibrate collaborating with investigators once I left academia. And I, I still don't know that I have it completely right. Um, it, it, it is hard um, because you have to be so protective in the startup. You have to be so protective. Your IP is, is kind of the only asset you have. Um, and, and so it just, it requires a lot of caution. Um, and that caution makes it complicated to just sort of sit down and, and spitball ideas with people, you know, because it, because everyone just guards more. So it's, it's, it's not easy. 
Um, with bigger companies, as the company grows, it becomes easy because you can sort of set expectations about how it's going to work. But early on, especially when there's an opportunity that, you know, there, there might be a financial opportunity, but there's no, um, there's no clear cut boundary between what the academics are working on and you're working on. I, I, it's a very difficult thing, right? Um, and anyone that's collaborated with a startup sort of shakes their head and saying, oh my God, these guys just keep coming back with more forms for us to sign and to negotiate. Um, but, the, but I'll tell you that the startups feel the same way, right? Um, and, and that it's hard to work with universities. It, it's just, it's a strange, it's a strange dynamic. Okay. How come questions about timing? When is the best time to start an entrepreneurial career? Do you need an MD, PhD, postdoc, or experience running an academic laboratory? Or are there experiences worth pursuing that may increase um, an individual's marketability when they pursue positions later? What are your recommendations to young students? So I will tell you that the, if you look at the data, the startups that are most likely to succeed are started by uh, people that are over 40. Um, and um, that's, that's just the data, right? So there are Mark Zuckerbergs out there, but there aren't very many of them, right? Um, most startups are gonna go on, succeed, are, are, being, are, are being led by people that have a lot of experience. And, and, and I think that's experience in a couple of things. It's, it's specific content experience in whatever industry is involved, right? Um, so if it's you know, if it's life sciences, if it's you know if it's um, you know um, you know I don't know kinase inhibitors, you know you do that for twenty years, you sort of understand a lot of things, and you can get out and go. It's a lot of life experience and sort of having kind of a level head and being able to sort of you know survey your landscape and make decisions about it. So I think there's something to be said about doing it older. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to be involved, but, um, but, you know, very early on, a lot of times what I tell folks is that, you know, if you're in your first year out of school, unless you have an idea that's just so compelling and not compelling to you, but compelling to other people, right? That's what matters. I mean, everyone thinks their ideas are great, but if someone else tells you this idea is great, unless you have that, I would hunker down. I would get a job. I would um, start getting some experience um, and, and let it go. Remember, one way to think about this is that, you know, sooner or later you have to retire. And, and the most important dollar you save towards retirement is the first one you save. It generates more interest than everything after that. And so in some ways, if you say across the arc of your career, when is it important to have stability? Kind of early on, it, it seems counterintuitive, but early on, I think it's actually really important to have some stability and, you know, when you can. Now, some people just want to go and they got to get out and they want to get into the startup. And I get that. And that's great. Um, but I think, you know, and this is my Midwest talking, I think um, you should be cautious early on, right? And, and be thoughtful about when's the right time to jump. So that actually segues really nicely into another question I've gotten in the chat box. Do you think personality is important to surviving in the industry? Or is it a learning process? Do you learn to be that kind of entrepreneur? I think personality is important in surviving anywhere, right? And, and you, you know, not everybody, not everybody can survive in a, you know, in an R1 research institution. They don't have the personality for it, right? That doesn't mean they have a broken personality. It means they have a personality that doesn't work there. Right. And the same thing is true in industry. You know, there are people that are finishing up their PhDs that cannot wait to get out the door. Right. And they're just like, they've been sending their CVs out since their first year, just trying to make sure they can get out when it's time because they know they don't want to be in academia. They want to be in industry. And at the same time, there, there are people that will thrive in startups and people that are, that will not. Um, I think a lot of times you don't know in advance, right. One of the tricks about academia is that, you know, if you're in, you know, grad school right now, the only real structured environment you've probably ever been in is that environment, right? And so you sort of assume this is what there is. Um, that's not true. There are many different cultures and there's many different ways of working that don't look like academia. Um, but I, I think it's really a matter of trial and error and getting in and seeing what happens and being able to step back and say, you know, this was a great move or, you know, frankly, this wasn't that great of a move. I don't think that there's as much risk in taking that shot and waiting to see what happens as people think. I mean, people, I think, can be very scared that the minute you step away from one thing, you'll never be back. Um, I will tell you that I, you know, I'm on committees within a university again right now um, because of stuff that we're doing with COVID-19. You know, and you, you can find yourself sort of back in there um, sort of surprisingly. So I, I don't, I think it's, it's important not to overemphasize the risk. And I think it's important to understand that you give those opportunities to try to see where your personality is the best fit. Speaking of COVID-19, talk to us a little bit about what sort of opportunities have come your way at this particular time and what attracted you to, to invest effort, spend time on some of those things. 
So, so a few things. And so the Science Center, so I, I work for a, um, for a organization in West Philly that's, a, that's been an accelerator and an incubator for a long time. We also do early stage investments. And so we have several companies that we've either incubated or that we currently have in, in, our, in the company's investment portfolio that are working on specific things. And those are things that came up in advance. They were already working on antivirals or even specific lung anti-inflammatory strategies that are really great fit right now, right? And so it's great to sort of try to help them out to make sure that they're seeing what, what opportunities there are in terms of collaboration, in terms of you know, federal funding to help support that. Um, but, um, but the other thing is, you know, for me personally, which was sort of a surprise is because I, you know, I do have an academic and I have a, and I have a, a clinical background. I've, I've had the opportunity to, to serve on a number of groups right now that are either monitoring the safety of current clinical trials. And so I'm, I'm participating in several DSMBs right now um, because I understand the issues, but I don't have a horse in the race. I, I am truly arm's length. I, I'm not a faculty at a university, but I understand the issues. Um, and, and I've also been helping um, uh, one of the region's universities think a little bit about how do you how do you best allocate resources to all the different clinical trials that are being proposed. Lots of folks are putting forward ideas. There's there's as many ideas as there are patients right now. And and in a perfect world, all the trials will never enroll because we'll start tamping this down, and the number of patients will go down. But in the meantime, trying to figure out as an organization how do you prioritize. How do you prioritize which clinical trials should be worked on first um, is a very interesting, it's a very interesting problem. And it, it's been a real honor to get to think about that a little bit. We could use your own NIH right about now. People are asking <laughs> questions and there are clear answers to them. I'm so close to the train station, I just can't go. <laughs> I remember that. So um, I have some, a couple of questions here about ideas. How does one feasibly know the idea is novel or interesting enough to merit the formation of a startup? Do you need a lot of legal experience or to solicit the advice of a lawyer or investors? Neither. Um, I, neither of those are the right answer. So what you need is you need to find, you need to go talk to 100 people that would be the people that would buy it and find out what they need, right? So at the end of the day, this is not about whether or not the investor loves you or certainly it's not whether or not your attorney loves you because your attorney loves you. Um, what it's about is somebody wants it. Um, and we, so when we started Acadia, and we had a, about 200 interviews in the can of, of people to try to understand what they were doing currently and whether or not there was a role for what we were doing. Um, and I'm also happy to talk offline to people about the sort of the formalism for doing those interviews because it does matter how you ask. But the thing that will decide whether or not you should go is, is market pull full stop. That's what matters. It's if you can demonstrate with reasonable assurance that people want it, um, then that becomes a company, right? Um, and the investors will follow that lead. So the investors may have a sense in advance, but if you come to an investor with data that says, we have all these people, we know what they do now and why it's not good enough, um, and here's what we propose instead, um, that will resonate, right? The investors will follow that. But this idea, this idea is called product market fit, right? If your idea is good, then it should be relatively straightforward to demonstrate that people will pay you money for it. I think the hardest thing I ever did in my entire career so far is when we were thinking about starting our company, we, we took empty vials and we put labels on them of what we sort of supposed we were gonna ultimately manufacture. And we started walking the halls of the University of Michigan and sitting down with colleagues and sort of showing them what the technology could do. And then saying, that will be $400 a bottle, please. <laughs> and actually, instead of asking someone, do you think this is a cool idea? Or, you know, what would you do with this? To ask them, you know, you know, if you give me a purchase order, you know, I can make, I can manufacture it without having to actually charge you yet. I don't charge you until I deliver. But to actually say, would you write a purchase order for this? That is a life transforming moment when you talk to a colleague and say, I need some money for this idea. I'm willing to pay for this. <laughs> but that's what has to happen, right? If, if that can't happen, it's not a thing, right? It may be brilliant, but it's not a thing. Right. And, and that that um, that sort of those sort of interactions really were what um, got me off the sidelines and, and helped me make the decision to, to do something different. So I sort of got a kind of provocative question. Can you tell us about any opportunities that you have declined because you thought it wasn't the best fit for you? Um, probably. Um, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I, I guess I have one. So, um, so I was, um, I was 
so when I left Michigan, it was about a year after the chair of my department had, um, had turned over to a new chairman. And during that chair search, I, the dean had approached me, um, you know, I'd been at Michigan for 20 years and I was approached, you know, do you, do you want the chairmanship? And I said, no, I didn't, I, I didn't have to think about it at all. So I, I didn't want that job. And it, it, it prompted my wife to ask, well, you know, if you don't want that job, what job do you want? <laughs> But, um, but I think that was, that was probably the first time where, where something that looked like, you know, a sort of traditional kind of arc of, you know, of career move, I, I simply, I didn't even have to think. I just like, this is not a thing I'm going to do because it's not the right fit for me, right? And, um, and, and, and you, you sort of learn things aren't the right fit by doing things and then, you know, and saying, oh, that was a mistake, <laughs> right? But I knew that I was not going to be a chairman of an academic department. There was just, there was no way that was going to happen, right? And it, but it, it took some soul searching and, and getting comfortable with the fact that because that was such an obvious next move, you know, that there wasn't something broken, right? It's like, you know, what's wrong with me that I would ever say no to an academic chairmanship? And, um, and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't the right job for me. And I, I still think that's exactly the move I should have taken. I should not have taken that job. Um, but, but you have to get comfortable with sort of saying, what are you and what are you not? Um, which is, it's just not easy. It takes time. You mentioned a couple times you have a good sounding board and a partner. Tell us a little bit about career change and how that was influenced by having a professional spouse and her uh, requirements in the workplace, how that dictated your choice. So it, it, it dictates a lot, right? So, so my wife is one of the directors of the Cardiovascular Institute at Penn. And, um, and when, I, when I was thinking about leaving my career at Michigan, she, she was an early, early stage faculty was just standing up her lab and we went out to dinner in like 2014 and and you know and i said I, i'm thinking about maybe quitting my job um and sort of laid out the case um and she just sort of nodded her head and said well if that's what you want to do that's what we should do and um and she was actually very flexible about it and then sort of interestingly in 2018 uh, we, she took me out to dinner and said you know i've i've, I've been recruited to, to penn we're moving to philadelphia <laughs> And so this, so this, five-year-old, <laughs> this five-year-old IOU came out of her purse. I was like, oh, I guess we are moving to Philadelphia. Um, there's a time and a place, right? So I think the thing is, is that you, one of the things that we find very useful is that in a given year, if you look at the productivity of either one of us, we have up years and we have down years, right? There's years where there's amazing things and there's years where everything seems to drag and you can't ever get a grip on the thing you want to get done. That happens to everybody, right? But what we do is, is if you sum over everybody's experience, right? You say, as a team, what did we get done this year? Then it becomes a lot easier to say, you know, we're going to make a change because, you know, the team accomplished this this year, right? And if you, if you add up all the accomplishments in the house, um, then, then you think about things differently, right? And so in a year where, you know, I, I didn't publish any papers last year, I don't know when I'm going to publish another paper, but we still had decent academic output out of the household, right? And so, um, so thinking about summing across all the people in the house and what did the team get done, um, I think that that simplifies things and it makes them less, um, it, it makes the sort of individual scorekeeping um, less of a problem. And that's, that's still there, right? I mean, you know, that's, you know, having a partner means, you know, trying not to keep score sometimes, but, but, but making sure that you sum across everybody and say, this is what, you know, this is what our address got done this year. That's, that's pretty good. That, that simplifies, I think, um, you know, how to keep that relationship honest, right? No, I appreciate the team approach there and considering productivity as an address. Yeah, sometimes easier said than done. We're coming close to the end of the hour, so I'm going to get down to the last question or two. I have one here. What are the biggest hurdles or challenges, and what's your advice for overcoming these challenges or hurdles? I think the biggest hurdles are what you, what you allow yourself to, to sort of dream about what you are, right? And I think that the, the biggest challenge is to get yourself past um, sort of self-imposed definitions about what success looks like and, and to just sort of say, what makes me feel fulfilled and, 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 and chasing that as opposed to chasing, you know, what's the appropriate metric, you know, that, that, that is, it's very hard. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of reflection to sort of say, this makes me happy. It may or may not look like, um, 
what what people sort of assume sort of the median sort of behavior is, but if it makes me happy, it's okay. I think that that's a real challenge, right? Um, and um, and I, it's it's true. I think at any stage in your career, right? What are you trying to get done? And giving yourself the latitude to do the thing that you think is really remarkable and isn't necessarily um, sort of chasing metrics that other people, you know, traditionally have used. It's it's not easy, but I, I think that's it, right? Giving yourself permission to do the thing that you need to do is 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 important and and and, and it, it's not simple it sounds simple but it, it can be quite difficult i think oh i think everybody appreciates that advice it's personalized it's empowering it's optimistic no matter what uh we thank you for the time you spent with us we've come to the end of our hour i can assure you i have twice as many questions in the box as i could possibly give to you Thanks. i know everybody appreciated hearing from you so thank you very, very much, John, for kicking off our inaugural webinar in this series. Um, best of luck to you as you approach the coming days, weeks, months thereafter. And um, just thanks again. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. And, and everyone, be safe. Um, and this is going to be OK. It's going to be amazing, but it's not going to be amazing quite yet. Um, um, please feel free to reach out to me if there's something I can do to help. You know, I'm here. Once people are traveling, if you come to Philadelphia, lunch is on me. I'm happy to take you out and brainstorm about stuff. But, but, but keep it up. It's going, to be, it's going to be incredible. You're going to be incredible. You just, just give it a little bit of time. Thanks. And thanks, everybody who participated. Put questions in the chat box. Have a great afternoon. Bye from thanks. all of NIGMS and John. Bye-bye. Okay.